uh, a few words about uh, the background of alchemy. Uh, the cosmological view of alchemy is millennia old. It's based on the idea that the earth is a womb which through natural processes gives birth to the crystals and minerals and metals. And that uh, to affect this transformation, there is a kind of celestial influence that makes this possible. Uh, the met metallic state is unnatural to nature. You must understand this. This is very, very significant. That is, nature abhors metals. And that's always predicted that in the old days that a day will come when men will use iron. And that will mean the end of the world. We're well, doing a very good job fulfilling this prophecy. Uh, we cannot imagine living in a world without metals. But uh, this is a very exceptional situation. Uh, if you wander in the forests, you'll never see metals. You might see mines which contain ores from which metals can be extra extracted. But you will never see metals, qua metals. You'll never see iron or copper, or tin, or zinc. The only exception is gold, gold and silver, which represent, therefore, an extra natural state of metallic existence, if I can call it that. The gold represents a kind of perfection of the metallic state, which is beyond the natural, if I'm beyond the natural order. On the basis of these uh, ideas, metallurgy developed but always in the context of a religious uh, world. It was protected. Even in up to the 20th century, some of the archaic African tribes, their metallurgists lived separately and they're protected as a particular caste uh, with special religious rites performed for them. The reason being that uh, they had to be protected from the malefic influence of metals. And they themselves would protect the rest of the community from the malefic and negative influences of metals. Now, all of this I'm telling you appears as total nonsense from the point of view of modern science. Uh, but you must understand the other point of view. Uh, and alchemy corresponds to something so profound that uh, there's more interest in alchemy today probably than there is in chemistry in many, in many places in the United States, despite uh, the official condemnation of it. It's, uh, it's still a very much of a living view of, of things. Anyway, uh, we have remnants of this up to this day. For example, Orthodox Jews do not circumcise with a metallic knife. It's a stone knife with which circumcision takes place. That's a remnant of that. Uh, there are certain saints we see in, Christian, in the Christian tradition, as well as in Islamic otherwise, who never carry metals with them. Who would never allow their body to touch metals. And all kinds of uh, phenomena like this, which have to do with the special state that the metals possess. And I said the metallurgist was originally a gynecologist, who delivered the fruit of the womb of the earth through certain sacred rites and rituals. There's nothing as opposed to the traditional way of looking at metals as this open earth, let's say, mining that goes on that you still have in Pennsylvania after one century, or you have in Wyoming, where you just dug, dig out the earth to pull out the gold or wherever it is and then leave all the gravel and everything around. Uh, you, you have no respect whatsoever, as if you uh, took a knife and cut a woman's womb from the outside and pulled out the baby and threw the woman in the wastewater basket, which is exactly what we're doing with nature. We're, do, we're doing that all the time with nature. And we don't even realize that we're doing it. The alchemical point of view was based on the sacral, in a sense, process of the delivery of the metallic and mineral uh, fruits of the womb of the earth. Now, about 4,000 years ago, uh, in the Babylonian civilization, some of these ideas became more crystallized. But it was not until the birth of Christ or thereabouts, about the first century B.C. to the first century A.D., during those two, three hundred year 
period, that's a two, three hundred year period, that alchemy as we know it arose. And it arose in two different parts of the world independent of each other. One in Alexandria and one in China. Alexandrian alchemy is without doubt heir to Babylonian and Egyptian alchemy. And alchemy is uh, definitely an Egyptian art that survived into the Greek period in this dress. Uh, I t talk about Babylonia, uh, some of these ideas become crystallized in Egypt, of course. Uh, alchemy, what we call alchemy, must have been very widely practiced. There are no people in the history of the world who have been able to deal with gold with the perfection that ancient Egyptians dealt with it. That's why even now the mask of Tutankhamen is a, like a siren song for us. It mesmerizes us. There's nothing like it. And if you ever saw the uh, beautiful sofa, sort of the gold sofa that Tutankhamen sat on, uh, nothing as perfect has ever been created. A great German scholar once said from the uh, Stone Age to the present, what a fall. Uh, and uh, really, when you look at uh, the metallurgical products of Egypt, everything is a fall from it. The French in the 18th century, at the uh, rule of Louis XIV, who called himself the Solar King, Le Roi Solaire, and therefore loved gold, tried to emula emulate uh, this grandeur of Egyptian art, making use of gold, except uh, the result is horrendously ugly from the point of sacred art. And if you go to the Louvre and just see the golden rooms of Louis the Fourteenth, uh, they're still there. They're the original rooms with all of the beds, everything is made of gold. Uh, it's very, very different treatment of gold. This is no longer the divine gold. And you have the same situation, of course, in South America with the Incas, who were massacred because of their gold and the use they made of gold as a sacred object not simply to get rich, as the Spaniards turned it out to be, but as a sacred object of the rituals. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have ever seen the, what remains of the gold of the Incas, which was not melted and taken to Spain, but in the original form. It is definitely a sacred art of dealing with metals. Anyway, around the time of Christ, uh, in Alexandria, these, uh, these practices, which had been going on for millennia in Egypt and in Babylonia, somehow became crystallized as a kind of science of the of matter, of the material world, of a science dealing with the material world. And alchemy began almost at the same time also in China. Uh, Chinese alchemy is almost completely connected with Taoism, with the Taoist sages that cultivated Chinese alchemy, and not with Confucianism. And almost all the major treatises of Chinese alchemy some which are now available in English, since the first one translated by Hoyt Wilhelm, famous synologue, which attracted the attention of uh, Carl Gustav Jung and then caused him to write the book on alchemy and psychology, a very famous book published by the Bollingen Foundation, full of marvelous illustrations. But Jung knew absolutely nothing about alchemy. This was a kind of slave uh, trade. That is, uh, he found a German uh, ex exiled scholar who was dying of hunger. And uh, he got him to do all the uh, manuscript work to get all his illustrations. And then he gave him some money to prevent him from dying. And he did all the work. Because when you open up that book, it's as if Jung had spent 30 years studying uh, uh, alchemical manuscripts. And that's not at all the case. That incredible book whose illustrations are remarkable. The first time that they're presented in the West. The text is quite something else. It's, it is Chinese alchemy that first attracted Jung. And I mention this because it's through Jung that alchemy has become so important in the 20th century for people who have no interest in traditional sciences otherwise. Jungian analysts almost all pay attention to alchemy. Uh, and it comes essentially, paradoxically enough, from, from the Chinese tradition because of the interest of Jung in, the, in Chinese alchemy, as was translated by, by Wilhelm uh, before him. Uh, it's, it's the secret of the golden flower, a famous Chinese alchemical text for which uh, Jung wrote a commentary, uh, an introduction and a commentary. Uh, it's also interesting for you to know why Jung became interested in alchemy. Uh, Jung, uh, of course, was an analyst. And many patients came to him speaking about having dreamt of a snake biting its tail. 
Now, the streets of uh, Zurich in Switzerland, you don't see snakes biting their tails. That's not a very common thing. So, well, it's not like having dreamt of having had some beer or something like that. Uh, where does this come from? And this, since it was repeated over and over again, uh, Jung became very much excited by the origin of this. He didn't know about it until he discovered in a, a chemical manuscript the famous symbol of the Ouroboros, that is the snake biting its tail, which forms a perfect circle. And he was astounded to find that you have this very powerful ancient alchemical symbol, which his patients had never seen. And yeah, because they were not studying alchemical manuscripts. Uh, and they'd never seen it in early 20th century Switzerland or Austria, places like that. That this, this would sort of come up from what he called a collected unconscious, which is, of course, nonsense uh, from the point of traditional doctrine because it's all the symbol descends from above and not from the garbage can of humanity. Uh, but that's my great criticism of, of Jung. Uh, anyway, but he had, he had to bring up the theory of, of what's called the collective unconscious, that is, uh, where, where he said uh, various generations of, of human beings discard the symbols and images. That's what I call the garbage can. And then this can always come up again within the psyche of a particular person. And this inter began his interest in alchemy, which then, of course, being such a famous figure that he was, called Gustav Jung, uh, introduced the idea of alchemical symbols to our society. There is, however, a very big difference between Taoist alchemy and Alexandrian alchemy. Alexandrian alchemy is what Western alchemy is all about. That is, alchemy in Europe, and later on in America, you know, there were alchemists in Massachusetts in the 17th century. The treatise published recently on an alchemist from Boston, uh, but essentially in Europe. Uh, Western alchemy comes completely from Islamic alchemy. And for the first thousand years of its history, the West had no al alchemy at all. Alchemy began in the 11th century in the West as a result of the translation of the Torah Philosophorum, the Picatrix. I will not hold, uh, hold responsible these titles at the present moment. Uh, of these major texts, uh, which were translated from Arabic into Latin. And Islamic alchemy itself comes from Alexandria, from uh, Alexandria Egyptian alchemy. I believe that there are certain elements of Taoist alchemy that enter into Islam, Islamic alchemy, especially the speculation upon the Ming Tang, this magic square. But that does not exist in Alexandria, and you find it in the founder of Islamic alchemy, Jabir ibn Hayyan, Jabir, uh, whose name at least I think you should know, the most famous of all alchemists in history. Incredible figure, very enigmatic figure, to whom uh, a couple of thousand treatises have been attributed. But there was certainly such a historical figure lived in the second Islamic century, very early. It was the student of Jafar al-Sadr, who was at once an alchemist and a Sufi and a scientist. You know, he wrote a book, a treatise on the cloning, on human cloning. It was a very, very interesting subject on how to make another human being. Because this is a discussion, I'm going to hear very soon, a uh, leading uh, Christian uh, theologian who has been working on this subject. I'm, I've asked her to give a lecture in this class on religion and science. Uh, the issues today concerning the idea of cloning, human cloning, which is such a cardinal issue, and you, the text has been handed out to you by Mrs. Breloff. Dr. Ch Chapman is going to talk about it soon. There's a treatise on, on human cloning by this man, but it's essentially known cloning, not in our sense of the term, but in, in another sense of how to reconstitute, in fact, the human uh, microcosm on, on the basis of alchemical ideas. Uh, he's the father of Islamic alchemy, and he was known in the West as Geber. He's also the father of Western alchemy in his Latin name. Uh, and in his writings, you, be you begin to see certain themes of uh, Chinese alchemy, but it's only secondary. The main body of Islamic alchemy definitely comes from Alexandria. Uh, the main difference in Chinese and Alexandrian alchemy is that Chinese alchemy has for its open goal the attainment of bodily immortality. In the same way that gold is immortal, that gold does not rust. It has perpetuity. Of course, immortality in a sense of perpetuity. Gold is perpetual. It does not rust. In the same way, the Chinese alchemists believed that you could transform the body inwardly through orifaction, the making of gold, into the immortal body. 
you've all seen these pictures of the Chinese immortals. The eight Chinese immortals are so they're in Chinese restaurants. You don't know what they are, but they're all over. They're very, very famous in Chinese iconography. They're really Chinese alchemists. The Taoist sages were alchemists. Now, uh, Alexander uh, alchemy does not emphasize that at all. It doesn't talk about individual immortality. It speaks about the possibility of the transformation, but in, technically we say transmutation. In alchemy, we talk about transmutation. The transmutation of base metal into gold. This is the program of alchemy. However, this is not what we think. It is true that, historically speaking, alchemy is a prelude to chemistry. But it's upon the cadaver of alchemy that chemistry was built, after the spirit was taken out of it. Alchemy is much more than what we call chemistry. Alchemy, in fact, is at once a science of materials, a science of the soul, a cosmology, and medicine. It's all these four at the same time. It is at, at once a science of materials, a science of the soul, a total cosmology, total science of the cosmos. And it is also a medicine. There's what's called, what we call green alchemy and green medicine, which are uh, practiced in Europe also for a long, long time. Alchemy is very closely allied to a certain type of medical practice. Now, I want to speak about all of these four for a few moments. They're already four, all four of the same thing. They're a re reflection of the same reality. But from our point of view, uh, we must realize it's not just uh, a sort of childish uh, chemistry. <coughs> First of all, the name. It's a very mysterious name. Without doubt, it's an Arabic name. It comes from Al Arabic. And it comes from the word, word alchemia, which in Arabic, interestingly enough, not only means alchemy, but also the Philosopher's Stone, which makes alchemy possible. That a mysterious Philosopher's Stone, Al-Hajar al falasifa which makes transmutation possible. I'll come to that in just a second. The trouble with alchemy is that once you begin, if, it's, if you have someone like me who spends a lifetime studying it, there's no end to it. I have to really curtail myself, just because that, just that point will take hours and hours of discussion. Uh, the question is, where does this part of the word come from? The Al, of course, is the particle. And, uh, and uh, Arabic. Where does uh, the word alchemy come from, uh, chemia come from? There are many different theories. But the most likely theories, theory which I accept myself, I said there are five or six different theories. I want to emphasize that again. Then a unanimity among scholars. But the one I accept is that this is an Egyptian word. It means the black soil, chemia, which covered the two sides of the Nile River. That's what Schwaller de Lubitsch also believed. That is the book on Schwaller de Lubitsch, a biographer from called Alchemia. And this black uh, soil, which covered the two sides of the Nile, was the source of all life in Egypt. It's what uh, made the enriched the soil and allowed growth and allowed life. It was a symbol of all life, this black soil. And uh, I believe it comes from that. There are other theories. Some people can think of the Greek. There's a one theory that the very word comes from the Chinese Chen Ya, which means the gold-making juice in Chinese. It's very interesting. Uh, very, very close to the word Kim Ya. The gold-making juice in Taoist Chinese alchemy. Now, alchemy was transformed into chemistry already in Islamic civilization. Except that the name was, the same name was used for both. I have an essay written on Mahmoud Zakar Razi from alchemy to chemistry. I believe it is he who first did this. 
who is, they know, the first person to divide substances into mineral, vegetable, and animal. Famous division, which was foundational to uh, science and, and still is. And uh, he uh, rejected the symbolic significance of alchemy and dealt with alchemy as a science and material. But the name in Arabic was still the same. And even today it's the same in Arabic. But in the West, the names began to separate from each other. And in the, in the Islamic world, alchemy did not die out. That chemistry was on the side of alchemy. Alchemy was still was the all-embracing perspective. In the West, there was a great flowering of interest in alchemy in the Renaissance. Tremendous flowering. And the hermetic sciences, of which alchemy is the most important, I'll talk about hermetics in a moment, uh, played a very important role in certain aspects of Renaissance science. If you read the book of Alan Debus, Science in the Renaissance, it's a very, very good book that brings this out. Uh, the, in the Latin West, after this flowering of alchemy, in which so many people were interested in alchemy, Sir Isaac Newton, the father of modern physics, practiced alchemy. We have his alchemical treatises that nobody wanted to touch since the 18th century because it would distort the image of the paragon of modern rationalism. But the treatises are there. They're in the Bodleian Library and some of them in Cambridge. I was a young man. I tried to, I had a great deal of interest in history of alchemy. I was trying to study them. They wouldn't let you see the manuscripts. And right now, Mr. Carmichael, who has been here several times to see me, was trying to get to Oxford to, to allow the Islamic, Islamic alchemical manuscripts and those of Newton to be made public. It's very, very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, anyway, uh, now we know something about the treatises of Sir Isaac Newton. Newton, the father of modern physics, and John Locke, the father of, of, of political liberalism, and what we think of sort of rationalism in, the, in a political philosophy, the father of British empiricism. And the whole series of correspondence with Newton. He keeps writing to Newton, now you know what the secret is, why don't you tell me? And Newton says, really, honest to goodness, I don't know what the secret is. And then he writes back again, they're talking about alchemy. So it was that widely practiced. But then, with the secularization of the cosmos, the symbolic aspect of alchemy was put aside, and uh, Boyle and others created what we call modern chemistry. But most of the main ideas of chemistry come from the alchemical tradition, from Islamic alchemy primarily. For example, the acid-based theory. You have acid based in salt. All of you have taken chemistry one. Uh, you, uh, you take acid, you have salt, uh, you have base, and you add them together and create salt. Now this theory, is really the old sulfur-mercury theory of alchemy. The masculine and feminine principles, when they add together, they, they, create, they create salt, which is, in a sense, the born of the birth of the yin-yang, and that's another application of the yin-yang. Uh, almost all of the instruments which uh, you, ha you have in a chemistry lab, you say chemistry one course, Almost all of them are alchemical instruments. They haven't even changed. Test tubes and all of the alembics and things like that. Some of them still have Arabic names. al anbiyah has become the alembic. There are many, many names. But there's one field in which you could not purify the Latin language from Arabic terms. Because there were no Greek equivalents for it. And so they stuck. There are so many of these alchemical terms that have stuck because of that reason. Anyway, uh, many, many of the ideas that... Uh, chemistry used at the beginning came from the body of alchemy. Many of the instruments came, and of course, uh, what changed was the symbolic significance of these. The substances were simply taken as material things, not as symbolizing something else. And that changed completely. But uh, uh, in the old days, even in classical times, it was believed that alchemy. Uh, was not only the transformation of matter outside, it was really a way of transforming oneself. That is, the real laboratory of the alchemist was himself, was the inner being. And that's also why in the old days, alchemists, when they died, they would put usually their caskets inside a metallic vault so people would not steal their body because others would, would try to steal the, the piece of the bone of, of the body of the alchemist to, to carry out transmutation. 
uh, this is a very, very famous practice in both Europe and the Islamic world. The great uh, Persian mystic and philosopher and physician and alchemist, Mir Fendereski, who died in the 17th century, who wrote a comedy on the Yoga of Asista, who Sanskrit, an unbelievable person, uh, we once re- repaired his mausoleum, his tomb in Isfahan, in Tafta Suleiman ancient cemetery. And uh, the, the dug on the two sides, I was almost sure, being an alchemist, uh, he, that would, this would be the case, with a huge metallic case underneath, so people could not dig a tunnel and steal the body from beneath. And that is, uh, has to do with the idea that the alchemist carried out this experiment within himself. So it's not very far from Chinese alchemy, from Taoist alchemy. And the, uh, people believed there was something in the bone of the alchemist that could be used for transmutation. Even, but even when alchemy was very popular, the real alchemists called those who only chased after making physical gold charcoal burners. In the West, as a pejorative term, charcoal burner. But the possibility of the transmutation of one metal into the other was, in the physical realm, was foundational to alchemy. And it was believed that this was possible through the correspondence that exists between the microcosm and the macrocosm between us and the world. Uh, there are people... In Islamic civilization, it was believed that there were people who could transmute base metal into gold by just looking at it. I was quote for my student a very famous poem, Persian poem. Anan ke khak ra be nazar ki miya konand aya ke mi shabad nazari ham be ma konand that is, those who transform earth into gold by just looking at it. Could they just simply cast a single glance at us? Of course, that's a reference to the spiritual teacher, to the spiritual master, who brings about transmutation. Uh, but the idea that this could be done by a correspondence between the inward and the outward was very much present. Uh, I have met alchemists. I've met living alchemists, people who actually uh, carry out transmutation. Of course, you know John Dee, the famous uh, alchemist and astrologer and mathematician, and also scientist at the court of Elizabeth I, was challenged to perform alchemy, and he took a silver coin like this big, which is is now in the Bodleian Library at the Institute of Science Museum at Oxford, in that library, Bodleian Museum. Uh, and trans- there is this well, whatever he did half of it is gold half of it is silver I have seen this done now I um, might be a fool you may be very sophisticated you will not be fooled but uh, anyway it's still being practiced what, what is done uh, is quite something else how, how is it done first of all on the basis of course of modern atomic physics anybody can do alchemy and you can transmute one element to the other is too expensive. You can take this, uh, record it, and turn it into gold. It's a much more expensive than the gold you import from South Africa, so nobody wants to do it. It's not, it was in the classical mechanical view of the world and Lavoisier's theory of, of uh, chem- chemistry in which el- an element was irreducible that, in fact, alchemy appeared as absurd. And it still, of course, appears to us as absurd today because we can do it only with external causes of banging electrons and protons into each other and changing the inner structure of the atom. But we cannot think of any other way of doing it. Anyway, uh, there is a great deal of interest in alchemy, uh, even from a scientific point of view. Not only because of its significance in the history of science, but because of the theories and that it presents. Uh, when the Americans bombed Hiroshima, a great tragedy took place that bring, brought the Second World War to an end. As soon thereafter, the United Nations was created. And in the first meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco, a French uh, group of French scholars came and they proposed uh, that the whole knowledge of atomic uh, bomb, of the atomic bomb, the Los Alamos Laboratory, all of atomic physics that had made the bomb possible, should be regarded by Western civilization as alchemy was regarded in the old days. That is, that was not for everybody, it was closely guarded and protected, it was not public knowledge. Of course, this was turned out immediately. Uh, uh, 
and the secrets of making that bomb were only given by Rosenberg to Russia and other, other countries followed. But the, uh, the scientific ideas were, of course, common being taught in every university. Western civilization could not accept that. But the fact that this proposal was made was very interesting. And then after that, a book appeared in Fran France, A Lobe de Mage, uh, which followed this idea that is at, at the dawn of the magicians, showing that, in fact, Western civilization was now beginning to make use of certain uh, ideas about nature, which are already esoteric and arcane and hidden and should not be made public, otherwise they'll be catastrophic for humanity. This is, a, this is another aspect of alchemy which has been very, very much discussed, especially in Europe during the last few decades. Now, alchemical transmutation, uh, uh, I will not go over the detail of its theory, how it's done. You'll be reading that chapter. That's all I require of you in this class. It's only possible with the presence of what is called the Philosopher's Stone. This mysterious substance, that unique something, substance, that unique something. Uh, you cannot just take uh, even, uh, if you know, take the symbolic aspect of things into consideration. You cannot take the laboratory and physical thing and transform one into the other, you need to have what, they, what is called the Philosopher's Stone. Now, what is the Philosopher's Stone? That, of course, is a $64,000 question. Uh, but that's not, never revealed by the alchemists, what the Philosopher's Stone is. A great deal of writing has been carried out about it, but it's always been kept a secret. Uh, Eugène Cancelier, one of the greatest authorities on alchemy of this century, who uh, apparently practiced alchemy, a French uh, scholar of alchemy and also an alchemist, has written a great deal about it. Eliade also has a very good book called The Forge and the Crucible, his book on alchemy, which is one of his very best books. I think the most profound things that Eliade ever wrote were the essays that he wrote in 1938 in the rare Romanian journal Zalmoxis, which I'm sure nobody in this class has seen, and the Russian rest will not have it for the next 2,000 years. But uh, anyway, the very, very rare journal, uh, essays he wrote on alchemy, which are really incredible. It shows this brilliant young man coming to the fore. From there, everything was, it went down. Uh, Zalmoxis, Z-A-L-M-O-X-I-S, the journal published in Romania before the Second World War. But later on, he took many of those ideas uh, and uh, wrote it in a book called The Forge and the Crucible, which is a very readable book on alchemy, not as good as the Burkhardt book, it doesn't have a metaphysical depth, but it talks about the Philosopher's Stone and the significance of the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, also, Burkhardt has a chapter in his book on the Philosopher's Stone. Anyway, the transmutation therefore represents something which is, quotes and quotes, supernatural. It is beyond the ordinary processes of nature. It implies always a spiritual presence. The Philosopher's Stone always implies a spiritual presence. Now, because of this, Alchemy from the very beginning was concerned with religion. And especially with mysticism, with the inner aspect of religion. That is, that aspect of religion that seeks to transform the soul. Alchemy is a yoga. Uh, the French author Maurice Agnan once wrote an article on uh, alchemy as Christian yoga. Uh, in my book, Science of Civilization and Islam, the chapter on alchemy, which is the most extensive thing, thing I've written on alchemy, there's also a chapter on Western alchemy, and not only Islamic alchemy, but on Western alchemy. Uh, I've already talked about that in case you're interested. Uh, yoga, the same way that it transforms the, the human being. Alchemy also, besides its aspects of uh, laboratories and materials and alembics and gold and silver and metal and crystals and all of these things, and the uh, creation of a vast body of knowledge about the natural world that it created was more than anything else a science for the transformation of the soul, the transformation of the whole human being. And therefore it was pounced upon, not by all mystics, but by many mystics of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, all three Abrahamic religions, and very similar to the Chinese case of Taoism. This is a wedding between uh, alchemy and the mystical aspect of religion. And there are many great Christian mystics uh, who have spoken in an alchemical language. The most famous of them, perhaps, is Jakob Berman. The incredible German uh, mystic and alchemist.
Jafar al-Sada. It's interesting, in the case of Islam, uh, the, uh, the founder of alchemy in Islam is considered to be a figure uh, who is one of the most important religious figures in Islamic tradition. The descendant of the Prophet, the sixth Shiite Imam, the founder of the legal school of 12 Imam Shiism called Jafari Law, at the same time the, the teacher of the first founder of the Sunni school of law, Abu Hanifa, an unbelievable scholar, uh, but also rigid, you know, religious authority. In addition to that, one of the poles of Sufism, and also considered to be the founder of alchemy. Now, German scholars before the Second World War tried to negate this possibility. But we have enough evidence to show that there's no reason to, to do so. There's no reason to deny the reality of Jabir and the fact that he was a student of Jafar al-Sadr. So in both the Islamic world and the Christian world, not to talk about Jewish alchemy, which began in Spain uh, as a result of contact with Muslims and continues for a long, long time. There were a lot of Jew great Jewish alchemists in Spain until uh, Muslims and Christians uh, and Jews were expelled from there. Uh, in all of these three cases, alchemy had one foot in the religious world one foot in the scientific world, you might say. Alchemy is one of the most important disciplines in the history of Western thought which relates religion to science. And very far from being simply an old superstition, it has now come up back in the 20th century in many different ways. First of all, in the New Age, there's a whole part of New Age which is devoted to alchemy. But I'll be put that aside. It has come up as a psychology as a as an in, way of insight into the nature of the human soul, uh, care of C.G. Jung and others, all of Jungian psychology, is totally wet to alchemy. It has come back in through certain of its ideas, which certain physicists, chemists, and others have tried to make use of to bring about a religious understanding and a philosophical understanding of their discipline. And the. The worldview of alchemy itself has been revived in our times by the magisterial works of people like Titus Burkhardt and uh, the works of Eliade and others as uh, one of the most powerful and important forms of traditional cosmology. Now, uh, to understand the cosmology that underlies the alchemy, we have to take a step backwards. And I want to say a few words about the hermetic tradition which in a sense provides the cos total cosmology for alchemy. Alchemy, I believe, is a kind of applied hermeticism. Hermeticism applied to the particular realm of uh, medicine, psychology, and the science of materials, what we call chemistry. But uh, hermeticism itself is a complete uh, total philosophy, and I want to say a few words about it. Because, again, we are living at a time of a major revival of interest in Hermeticism. Around the birth of Christ, at the same time that these alchemical treatises appear in Alexandria by Democritus, uh, Bolon, Zosimus, other al uh, Alexandrian alchemists, you don't have to know their names, uh, there appear a number of treatises, a whole body of works, attributed to the figure of Hermes. Sometimes associated with the Greek god Thoth, considered by Muslims to be the prophet Idris. It's the same thing as the Hebrew prophet Enoch. These, of course, are later identifications. It begins with this. Now, Hermes, Hermes is a god. So the body of works are not written by ordinary human authority. It doesn't have an author or ordinary author. It appears in the name of the god Hermes. Sometimes associated with Agatha Demon. Uh, anyway, the god of knowledge. And this Egyptian god, Thoth, and the Greek god, Hermes, became sort of fused together as a single figure. And they appear as a function rather than a person. And the function then produces these works. The kind of, like, almost a, like a revelation. Anyway, about 50 treatises appear in Greek, which are later on translated into Arabic. They do not go to the West. It's interesting. Like alchemy itself, 
Hermeticism doesn't go to Europe. There is no early medieval Hermeticism in Europe. It's like many things in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, that nothing to do with the Western Mediterranean and Western Europe until much later on. And the, uh, the idea of coming back, the back is not correct. It remains in Alexandria. It doesn't go to Rome, it doesn't go to Cologne, it doesn't go to Germany, until much, much later. It remains in the Eastern Mediterranean world uh, until the rise of Islam, when it's translated into Arabic. Uh, and the whole uh, story, or myth in the positive sense, of Hermes, as there being three Hermeses, is then developed by Muslims, what we call the thrice greatest Hermes. Must have all in high school read the poem of Longfellow and the thrice greatest Hermes. Longfellow loved Hermes. Um, but the Trismegistus, Hermes Trismegistus. That was the title given by Muslims. In the Greek sources, there are only one Hermes. In Islamic sources, you have three different Hermes, all of whom are prophets, through each of whom God reveals certain arts and sciences and philosophy. Hermes is considered to be the father of philosophy. Now, from an Islamic point of view, why does God have to reveal only ethics or theological matters to a prophet? Why can't he reveal astronomy, let's say? In fact, Muslims believe that the origin of all the arts are revelation, are divine, and the sciences. Exactly like the Hindu case, where Shiva, for example, has brought music from heaven. And the origin of, of Indian music it comes from, from heaven. Islam also believes that astronomy... Uh, mathematics, uh, of course, astronomy, cum, astrology, uh, alchemy, and then also uh, the art of building, of writing, of uh, irrigation, agriculture, all of these sort of arts and things with which human beings live were revealed through these three Hermeses, of whom the last, in fact, was the Hermes that uh, was uh, identified with this god in Alexandria. But the Muslims take it outside of the context of a Greek god and put it into context of an Abrahamic prophet. In fact, three prophets. And the Diluvian, before one, the first one is before Noah. The second one is after Noah, and the third one is much later, uh, after Abraham. Uh, so the Muslims take this corpus, which become very popular in the Islamic world. Now, everybody reads it, very significant influenced as a philosopher as great as Ibn Sina, and especially influenced in the field of, of mathematics and, and astrology and astronomy, uh, as well as alchemy, and the science, as you might say, and medicine. Then uh, the Hermetic Corpus is translated in the 11th century, gradually in Spain, from Arabic to Latin. And Hermetic philosophy begins to be known gradually in the West on the basis of Islamic Arabic sources. As the Middle Ages dies out, as the scholasticism becomes attacked in the 14th century uh, by logicians, essentially by logicians, Hermeticism, which was always a rival philosophy to Aristotelianism, also in the Islamic world. Hermeticism was always a rival to Aristotelianism. Uh, and scholasticism was essentially Aristotelianization of Christianity, or Christianization of Aristotle, whichever way you like to look at it. But it had a strong Aristotelian element in it. As the Aristotelian Christian structure of scholasticism begins to crack in the 14th century, Hermeticism gains more and more adherence until with the breakup of the, of the Middle Ages in the 15th century, suddenly Hermeticism flowers as never before. Part of it due to the fact that uh, it was the doctrine held by many secret organizations whose teachings were oral and now suddenly become written down on paper. That's one of the, the really, really the main reasons for it. It isn't that there's a new discovery of Hermeticism. It's a, uh, a kind of outward manifestation of something which was held in an oral way among group of initiates in the Middle Ages. Then, uh, when the Florence Academy established 
by the famous Italian philosopher. whose name we must know, Marsilio Ficino, the famous 15th century Italian philosopher. Ficino knew Greek and established an academy in Florence, called the Florence Academy or Florentine Academy, to translate works from Greek into Latin, in a sense skipping over the Arabic. And by that time, an original manuscript in Greek of the Corpus Hermeticum was available from Byzantium. By that time, many of the Byzantine scholars had migrated uh, to Italy, and they brought this manuscript with them. And so in the 15th century, this collection was translated into Latin directly from the Greek, called the Corpus Hermeticum. I want everyone in this class to know the name of this. It is Latin form. You can say Hermetic writings, but that does, you know, that's a bit too diffuse. So just let's keep the name by which it's been known for the last 500 years, 600 years, the Corpus Hermeticum. This has been translated several times into English, especially by Scott and by Mead. These are two famous translations, both in four volumes, done in the early part of the 20th, 20th century. And they've been reprinted recently. Both the Scott and the Mead translations have been reprinted. Scott was a famous scholar, I think from Oxford, who sort of represented the academic uh, appreciation of this. Mead was an English scholar, occultist, esoterist, who wrote a great deal on the more esoteric currents of Western thought. Uh, anyway, uh, the Corpus Hermeticum, everybody thought at that time, was much older than Plato and Aristotle. They would believe that this was the primordial, most ancient uh, origin of all religious and scientific thought and philosophical thought. It took some time for people to realize that in fact this body of writings at least was put on paper later on, much later than Plato and Aristotle, by several centuries, by three, four centuries. Anyway, uh, the whole of Renaissance science is dominated by various aspects of Hermeticism. Hermeticism is extremely important, especially in medicine and of course alchemy, chemistry, in natural history. When we read the text of Agrippa, all of these famous Renaissance natural historians, the context is really a kind of hermetic philosophy. Hermeticism provides a bridge between religion and Renaissance science. This is before the scientific revolution of the 17th century. And that's what I'm discussing in this class. Hermeticism is one of those major philosophies. First of all, vying at the philosophical level of Platonism, Neoplatonism, and Aristotelianism. One of the major philosophical systems but one which was on the one hand related to development of science, in, especially in the Renaissance, and on the other hand to religious currents in the Renaissance. And so we must remember it for that. With the scientific revolution in the 17th century, uh, Hermeticism is more and more discarded. Giordano Bruno, whom all of you know, who uh, I'll be talking about him, again in the future, who was burned at the stake in Italy for several reasons, one of which was the claim that the universe was infinite, uh, and was considered to be one of the great heroes of modern thought. Everybody was burned at the stake in the Middle Ages, was picked up in the historiography of the later century as being a great hero of modernism, liberalism, enlightenment, rationalism, and so on and so on. Now, it's been shown by Francis Yates, who died a few years ago, a great English scholar, that he was a hermeticist. She wrote a book called Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, which really shook the foundation of Western scholarship. The image that people had that Bruno, uh, Galileo, Newton, these were sort of modern men like us, because they were opposed to the church and opposed to the medieval worldview and this kind of thing. Uh, and therefore, these people have been to great heroes. Operas have been made of them. Books have been written about them. Uh, to discover that this man, in fact, was a hermeticist, belonged to the hermetic tradition, which was debunked since the 17th century, was, of course, a great shock. But not all scholars accept that, that even a person like Bruno, Giordano Bruno, belonged to the hermetic tradition. And so the hermetic tradition plays a very important role until the 17th century scientific revolution takes place. And although the great founders, like Kepler and uh, Newton, especially those two, were very much interested 
one in Hermeticism, alchemy, the other one in Pythagoreanism. After that, in fact, the universe becomes mechanized, rationalism takes hold after Descartes and Wolf and Spinoza, and Hermeticism is more and more ostracized to the margins of Western thought. For the next uh, 300 years, that is from the 17th to the 20th century, the only place where Hermeticism is still a powerful force is in Germany. It goes right from the Hermetic schools to Jakob Böhme to uh, Hegel, who read Böhme, who read Hermetic texts, was influenced by them, to Schelling and the whole Natur Philosophia, that is natural philosophy schools of Germany in the 19th century, which is inseparable from Hermeticism. But nevertheless, it remained on the margin. In, the, in England and in France, it was reduced to the realm of occultism. Almost all occultist schools in France and, and England were, of course, very much interested in Hermeticism. In the 20th century, in the last 40, 50 years, the situation had changed completely. Hermeticism, along with alchemy, has been revived very much in continental Europe as a philosophy. In America, there's no interest in it whatsoever, uh, except, you know, for Hermes typewriter and things like that. But I mean, nobody talks about hermetic philosophy, uh, except uh, some occultists. But in Europe, it's not like that. Uh, first of all, a new school of anthropology has begun in France during the last 40, 50 years. Uh, which uh, calls itself uh, l'anthropologie hermétique, that is hermetic anthropology. And uh, there's in, pla in France a whole series published called Le Cahier de Hermétisme, which is a whole library, monumental library like this. Uh, Gilbert Durand, who is one of the greatest philosophers in France, uh, the author of the book uh, on uh, Hermetic Anthropology, and the uh, founder of a great center in France, uh, uh, Centre l'étude de l'Imaginaire, uh, he has, uh, he is now about 80 years old, he's much older, 75, 80 years old, he's very sick now but he is the founder of a whole new school of hermetic anthropology. So the field of anthropology has been really deeply transformed by uh, hermetic philosophy. And now there are people who talk about uh, the importance of, her of hermeticism as a kind of new philosophy of science, philosophy of modern physics. And uh, hermeticism is very much alive at the present moment in the continental uh, part of, of the West, that is in Germany and, and France and Italy and you cannot imagine the number of books that come out in this subject. I can hardly keep up with it. Uh, I should, but I, it's impossible just to keep oneself in this one field. is really an impossibility. I, might, I have no place left in my room for the next issue of the Cahier that is sent to me. I don't know where to put it. Uh, but I just say this to impress upon you the significance of hermetic philosophy, having had a long career, having been sort of the father of alchemy as far as the general world view but a philosophy which was always interested in philosophy of nature. Uh, Hermeticism is very much interested in the study of nature from a philosophical religious point of view. And uh, its role in, again, as a kind of cement for the religious and uh, scientific aspect of endeavor in Western civilization is very, very important, very important. All right, I'll stop here. And uh, we're going to have one more lecture on pre-modern science which we given on the Native American tradition by Mr. Breloff on the Navajo especially cosmology. And that will complete our set of pre-modern science and the rest of the course will be devoted to modern science. And we're going to have a little bit of reversal of uh, chronology as, as I would have liked. We're going to have uh, three lectures coming up given by people who are specialists in modern, I mean really contemporary science. One uh, by uh, Dr. Chapman on Christian theology and religious, uh, the whole religious dimension, the question of cloning, which is a very, very contemporary uh, point of contention between religion and science, of course. And then two lectures by a modern cosmologist, I mean, a specialist in modern cosmology and, and quantum mechanics, uh, on the relationship between big, big Bang Theory and modern cosmology and modern science and, and religion. And then we'll go back and uh, take on from the scientific revolution and build up.